Let me introduce our guest for tonight, John Marty. He's been a senator in the Minnesota legislature since 1987. He is a national authority on what is often referred to as universal health care. For those not in Minnesota, I think you'll find that Senator Marty is uniquely adept at making the sometimes complex issue of healthcare accessible through clear communication. He also naturally brings the issue down to how people personally experience the current system and what they'd experience in a new one. If you've been to these webinars before, you know we talk about that all the time, making sure that you frame well, but also make sure you include people in your messages as often as possible. We often talk about authenticity in our candidates. Authenticity comes from really caring about people. I think as you'll see, Senator Marty is the very embodiment of that on uh, authenticity. So let's welcome John Marty. Thank you, George. Very kind. Um, and you wanted to start with the overall discussion of Minnesota Health Plan for five minutes and then open up or how did you want to get it started? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, let's let's let people know know what it is so that they'll, sure. uh, you know, they they can see the, uh, you know, get get a, an idea of what the plan is and and why it's it, it's really so unique and so important, uh, not only in Minnesota but I I really think this is a blueprint that can be used in any state. Thank you, and um, because it's a universal health care plan, it's something that a lot of people have been pushing for since Francis Perkins during the New Day New Deal wanted healthcare for all to be included as part of the New Deal. And so it's been a target for a lot of people who care about others for 80 plus years. And, um, and it's long overdue we deliver it. And I like to describe Minnesota Health Plan as just a common sense healthcare system. What would we want the healthcare system to do? It's, a, it's what we call a single payer system. I don't use that terminology a lot because um, people know they love it or hate it, but they don't know what it is. Um, but I like to say what we want is a healthcare system that's common sense and that functions. And so the way it actually came about was by putting together a list about 20 years ago of, of things that I thought any good healthcare system, if we want a good healthcare system, figure out where you want to get to. And so we put together like at the time nine principles later became 10 things like it should a good healthcare system would cover everyone without exception would cover all your medical needs, including things like dental and mental health and prescription drugs and addiction services and everything, hearing, vision, everything. And um, would give people the choice of the care they want. Namely, you choose the providers, the hospitals, no networks kind of thing. And that medical decisions are made by you and your medical professionals that you choose not by insurance companies or governments or employers. Um, you'll be funded in a fair manner so everyone contributes to it and so it's affordable to everyone. So based on ability to pay. It would be one that focuses on prevention and public health. Anyway, put together these nine principles, 10 principles later and, and actually introduced it first as a bill that at the time there was a Republican governor would have had the Republican health commissioner design a healthcare system that met those principles. People, why would you, what a Republican design what our healthcare system should be like? I said, I don't care who designs it. As long as it meets those goals, it's a logical system, I'll support it. Of course, the bill didn't pass and I became chair of the health committee and not seeing any bills ever in Minnesota. And I was there when Minnesota care was proposed and enacted and so on. It was supposed to end up covering everyone. Affordable Care Act was supposed to cover everyone. I've never seen any other bills in Minnesota that would truly cover everyone. And um, so I introduced a bill that was designed around those principles. Matter of fact, Article 1 of the bill requires that the bill would be legally bound by those principles. Um, it has to make sure there are enough providers. So the health plan has to address that as well. Um, so that was how it was designed. And again, it is, as I said, a single payer, the financing, in other words, one entity finances it all. We all contribute to that entity through our, we call it premiums in this case, but premiums based on ability to pay, not based on how old and how sick you are, which is the way we currently tend to do it. Um, and a system that focuses on how we get care to people where they need it. One of the aspects are thousands of things you might not think of in a healthcare system, but that you put together and how you make it well. Um, why do we have 
healthcare, where's the best place to reach kids who are like four years old to 16, 18 years old? The best place to reach them during much of the year is the school. So why don't we have clinics in the school? Well, who's going to pay for it? Um, well, they can build your insurance plans, but not everybody is Blue Cross and not everybody is any one system. But if you have a universal health care system, you decide we're going to intentionally put a clinic in the schools. We're going to intentionally put them in a large um, downtown office building, in a large retail complex. Whenever people gather, it might be logical places, but most of the clinics would be the existing ones, existing hospitals, existing uh, providers. A logical system is all we're looking at. How do we fund it? How do we pay for things? Well, the American system is for the last 40, 50 years tried to save money. We're going to make the system more efficient. How? Well, medical care is so expensive, so we'll try and make you need less of it. How will we do it? We'll have somebody who manages your care. So we call HMO movement started that and everything beyond that. Affordable Care Act had these accountable care organizations. All of them are people who are going to have the, their businesses whether for profit or nonprofit, their businesses, they're going to make sure people don't overuse healthcare. And how are we going to do that? We're going to provide the right incentives to medical providers. So they'll do not too much stuff and not the wrong stuff because our healthcare is funded by what we call a fee for service system, which is basically the way we fund virtually everything in the economy, fee for service or price for product. That's how the economy works. But for some reason in healthcare, some health insurance companies and others decided, you know, <clears throat> that's wasteful here. People are going to want too much of it if we do it fee for service. So if we create this new entity, hugely bureaucratic entity that does this and make sure then they're going to manage your care for you and make sure you get the right care. Well, insurance companies managing your care is, that's not really what they're doing. They're managing their claims payments, trying to reduce their claims payments, which might give you in some cases good care, it might not in other cases, and that's not their biggest concern. Their biggest concern is managing the claims. And so we set up a system that tries to address these issues in a logical, common sense way. And so when people say, well, the public would never support this, I don't know if you track the polls much or not, but when they poll for universal health care, Medicare for all, single payer type of system, Generally, it pulls in the upper 50%, upper 50s, lower 60%, depending on how you frame the question and so on. And But President Obama, when he was proposing Affordable Care Act, he had earlier when he was a state, when he was an Illinois senator, he had said, you know, what we really need is a single payer system. He said, but we can't get there. It's not politically realistic. What do we need? Well, we need Democratic majority in the House, which they didn't have then. They'd have a need of Democrat majority in the U.S. Senate, and they need a Democrat in the White House. Well, five years later, they magically had all of those three things, and he was the Democrat in the White House who could control it. But, you know, the public would never accept universal health care. So we got to fight for something else. That makes sense to us. It's logical. It's common sense. It's cheaper. And it might make sense to others if it makes sense to us, if we think we're thinking people. But we can't do that. So instead, we got to create this very convoluted system, which will make sense to bookkeepers and accountants and paper shufflers. And by doing enough of the right paper shuffling, we're going to reduce the need for healthcare. And so to me, we tried to create a system that simply does what we want, a healthcare system that delivers healthcare to people when they need it. And we are looking right now, we're fighting for the House Human Services Bill has a half million dollar appropriation to do a study of the Minnesota health plan as opposed to the current system. You can't do a study of one because they'll say, oh, look how expensive it is. Bernie Sanders, Medicare for all, the Mercatus Institute, which is funded by the Koch brothers, if you need to know their affiliations. Um, the Mercatus Institute did a cost analysis of Bernie Sanders plan and they claimed it would cost $32 trillion over the next 10 years. That's a lot of money. And of course, some other analysts said, you know, even using Mercatus Institute's numbers, which are pretty suspect to most people, I would think, um, but use, even using their numbers, you kind of concluded, well, you know, actually it might save $34 trillion in the private sector. So actually it might be cheaper, but we're talking about the cost of it to the government. And since our government spends nationally and in Minnesota, we spend about a little over half of our healthcare dollars come from government. 
whether it's for public employees coverage or Medicaid or Medicare or VA um, or tax subsidy, everything, you count everything federal and state government spend on healthcare, it's about half of it. And so if we're gonna have 100% of it funded by one entity, in this case, Minnesota Health Plan, oh, it's gonna be so much, it's gonna double the public spending on healthcare. Public spending on healthcare, that's one sixth of the economy. So we can't talk about that, it's scary. Vermont started looking at that way. So our cost analysis would be what we're doing now versus what we're doing under the new one. And I want them to calculate in our study language is written to include everything, not just the costs that insurance companies and payers and payees and everybody else covers, not just out-of-pocket expenses, but also the time employers spend shopping for the right insurance plan and training their employees and the time you as an individual spend trying to figure out the bills and trying to um, pay the co-pays and everything else. Your time um, is a cost too. And we want to figure out all those costs and then all the costs, the other one. And my argument is it's actually cheaper, but we didn't design the bill that way. The plan is not to have a health plan that saves money. The plan was to have a health plan that keeps people healthy and gets them the care they need when they need it, to have a more vibrant, healthy, better society. And ironically, we believe it's cheaper. And there's plenty of empirical evidence from around the world, plenty of academic research in this country on various single payer proposals and they come out showing it's cheaper. And I can explain why if we wanna get into that, but that's basically what the plan is. You use the same doctors, same providers that you have now, unless you don't want to, if you wanna use somebody else, you no longer have to worry about out of network. You don't have to worry about whether the procedure is covered or not. You don't have to worry, well, this would be a lot better for me, but I can do this instead because I can't afford that. You don't have to worry about any of those things. You don't have to worry about staying in your current job because if you leave your job, you lose your benefits. Um, you're covered cradle to grave for all your medical needs. And, and by not focusing on these convoluted payment schemes, but simply saying, let's negotiate fair prices for things and we're gonna pay them directly to the providers. We're not gonna have middlemen. And now we have two middlemen in most cases. We had the insurance companies. Now we have hospital systems or health systems as they call them, which is a second middleman. So we have middlemen paying middlemen who pay the providers in a convoluted method. And we have to set up all the analytics for it. And, and so we create huge new numbers of jobs of healthcare analysts and bookkeepers and so on. And we get worse healthcare out of it. And our health outcomes, even though we spend literally twice what any other country on the planet spends, twice or more per capita on healthcare with maybe, I think it's eight, maybe it's nine other exceptions to it. All of those other nine spend far less than we do, but more than half. And so if we're spending that a lot more than anyone else, and we are not having better health outcomes, despite being the wealthiest country on the planet, our life expectancy is significantly shorter than other countries, other in Western industrialized countries, significantly shorter. Infant mortality rate is like, I think five or six times that of Iceland and some other healthier communities that we might consider competitor nations. Um, our outcomes are worse. And so all we want is a logical common sense system. When somebody attacks it, oh, if they say this is socialism, which this isn't, the VA is socialism, Medicare is not, it's private providers largely. And so it's not technically that, but when somebody says something like that, just, well, then they try and say, well, this system is gonna take away all your choices. No, that's not what we're trying to create is a common sense system that lets you have the choice that lives by these principles. And it, it kind of throws them for a loop a little bit because they're, they're expecting to have to fight about, oh, well, we're not gonna take away your choice because yeah, we're not gonna give them a choice of insurance companies because we aren't gonna have any insurance companies. We're gonna give you a choice of the providers you want. And even those who think, well, but I still, I'd rather have a choice of my provider. And then you gotta get into the mechanics of, well, we don't just have one health insurance package. At least most of us don't. We have a health insurance, we have a dental insurance. Some people have a long-term care insurance. If you're a senior, you have a prescription drug insurance under Medicare Part D. And I'm sure every senior in Minnesota is thrilled to know they have two dozen choices of insurance companies for their prescription drugs. And I have yet to find a single senior in Minnesota who thinks that's a wonderful idea. What they want is the drugs they need when they need them that they can afford. They don't want to have a choice of insurance companies to tell them which drugs are in the formulary and not. 
that's my long-winded short introduction to the bill for you to chip away at. That was pretty good. Um, uh, uh, you, you also, uh, this is a quote from your book, but it says the Minnesota health plan is nothing more than what any caring society would desire in order to ensure good health care for all its people, which is a very concise, you know, the, this is the kind of message we, we counsel people to, to make, to construct. And um, so I thought that was pretty good. Um, uh, so another question is when, uh, so, so what, what is the problem? I mean, with, you know, we have every other nation in the world or, or at least every other, you know, modern nation in the world is, it, it has already jumped on it. It's all of the, uh, the evidence we have says that it works. There is no evidence that says that it doesn't. Uh, why is it so hard to get this passed in here in Minnesota or in the United States? Uh, two biggest things I would I point out would be one of which is the cult of, of corporate healthcare. Industrial, the, we talked about military industrial complex. We've got the health industrial complex here um, where hospital systems used to be Non I mean, Mayo Clinic is still nonprofit, but it's making decisions on rural hospitals. They're making, it's a hospital system now and they've closed down the Fairmont Hospital. They shut down two thirds of the Albert Lee Hospital, not because there wasn't need in those communities, but because it didn't fit their business model. And, um, and the problem is all these entities, even the nonprofits, because Minnesota until about four years ago, five years ago, six years ago, the only people who could sell direct to consumer health insurance plans were nonprofit. We were the only state out of 50 and the Republicans in charge of the legislature at the time just said, that's a terrible thing to have. We can't be an outlier like that. We're, we're suffering in Minnesota from that. We'd have more competition if we allowed for-profits in. So they did. And of course, um, why do for-profits want to be in? Because they can make money. United Health Group, where they make $5 billion in profits last quarter. Um, five billion dollars. Um, it's uh, those groups all have cult. The pharmaceutical industry has cult, and everybody's getting their niche, their little niche in it where they can make money off of it. And so, to me, that's the biggest problem. Um, related to that, you get politicians who are benefiting from their support. Um, this is not a Republican only thing, this is Democrats and Republicans who get money from. Um, the industry that does it. Look how many of the nonprofit patient advocacy groups on things like mental illness or things like, um, I don't want to call it specific ones or anything too much, but um, how many of them get funds for from the pharmaceutical industry? Um, and when you start talking about regulating pharmaceutical prices, negotiating them fairly, um, well, those groups kind of, we got to stay away from it because some of our funders are in there. And so they've been a very masterful job of doing that. And that's the number one problem is the money involved, the people fighting it. And the second one is that one political party doesn't believe in universal health care. They really, I would argue, don't give a rip about it. A lot of the members of the party care, but the people in charge Office of the party, they're elected. Are up for re-election plus the 11 direct. Yeah, a lot of people, yeah, they, they want um, a lot of the Republicans in office just don't care. I mean, last year on similar unrelated health care, but for the SNAP, the food stamp program, they would have provided benefits free of charge to Minnesota to people up to 200 percent of the poverty line, which is where people start making ends meet about 200 percent of poverty. We had retirees doing, oh, they say, oh, that makes people lazy, makes people lazy. So the they fought against that federal funding. So some of them, you have to wonder, do they really care? But for Democrats, oh, we care deeply. We want universal health care, but you know, we can't get there politically. And so the biggest obstacle among a lot of Democrats is, oh, we can't get there. And that's absolutely a self-fulfilling prophecy. You cannot get there if you don't intend to get there. And um, I'd say my political party has been suffering a lot of that in recent decades where we don't we can't really get there. It's not politically feasible. And again, as I said, that's self-fulfilling because if if I'm not going to fight for it and you're not going to fight for it because it doesn't have a chance, nothing's going to happen. So I'd say the biggest obstacle is the money and the clout of the groups fighting against it. Second biggest obstacle is politicians who 
maybe partly sympathetically to what we've got now and we don't want to rock the boat too much and it might be unpopular and it's not politically feasible. And, um, and to me, that's how we get the Affordable Care Act type of thing because we can't do what makes sense to us because the public would never expect, accept that. So we have a Affordable Care Act that is originally passed with like 2000 pages. And there's one conservative commentator who was kind of defending it saying, you know, he was defending against Sarah Palin and Michelle Bachman at the time saying, you know what, this isn't some radical, radical revolutionary new healthcare system. It's basically a piling on of the system we already have. Something that's ideal for bookkeepers and accountants and lawyers, not something that patients and doctors and nurses would want. And, and why would we think that patients and doctors and nurses would want that? I know why United Health Group wanted it. I know why all the insurers wanted it. And we support it because it helps cover more people. So it did some good things. It's nothing like that. But in the end, it cost Democrats the majority in the US Congress in 2010, right after it passed. Um, it cost the, in the US House, that was the 2010, and lost most of the Senate majority. And in 2014, the year it was implemented, um, we lost the Senate and, um, and I think uh, Mitch McConnell credits the Affordable Care Act for them picking up Donald Trump as well. Um, so we've lost three national elections by doing something that we thought the public wanted because we knew they didn't want what we thought makes sense. And my pitch is always, if something makes sense to you, you might be able to persuade somebody else it makes sense too. If it doesn't make sense to you, you're probably not going to be as successful. Right. You know, it, it, and, and it's interesting in your, in your book, you talk about the, the politics of pragmatism and it, and it comes from a timidity to, uh, to want to get these things done. I, you know, or, or, or timidity uh, from, for, uh, for, for getting people upset or, 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 or turning the voter off. And in, in, our, in our webinars, we talk about tactics versus strategy and Democrats are tactical. We think about what we need to do to win this election. And that's it. We're not strategic. The conservatives are strategic. The, all their messaging includes messages behind the immediate message that reinforce their worldview, that reinforce the frames they want us to use to think about the world. And so what happens to Democrats, because we're not strategic, is our strategy, if we had one, would be in complete, op or, or our tactics would be in complete opposition to our strategy. Our strategy. If we Absolutely. actually had one. In, right. In Absolutely. And that's, and that's a good way of framing, because it, it really is what we're doing. And, um, and the other thing I'd say, yeah, when I, when I use the term pragmatist, the, those who say, instead of fighting for our principles, we'll fight for pragmatic stuff. They're absolutely anti-pragmatic. They're not being pragmatic at all. They're saying they are because they think they are. I mean, if I had any one occupation on the planet, I wish we could just abolish. Wouldn't be lawyers, it wouldn't be whatever, it would be, it would be political consultants because they know what it takes to win elections and they're usually wrong, but they absolutely sure they're doing the right thing. And, and I remember a time when I first ran, I was outspent two to one. Um, Paul Wellstone, his first race, he was outspent seven to one. Democrats were always outspent in the past with very few exceptions. Nowadays, Democrats are, we out, outspend the Republicans in Minnesota House, Minnesota Senate, individual races and in governor's races, US Senate, US congressional races. We outspent Republicans, whether you count the candidates own spending or the candidates spending plus affiliated groups in the political parties. We're outspent all, we outspend them all the time our message is supposedly better and um, we're losing. And maybe I, I think what we ought to be doing is, um, what I think we ought to be doing is trying to change it so that we, we don't focus on the money, we focus on what makes sense and trying to explain to the voters why it makes sense to us and recognize they may not agree 100% of the time, but if it makes sense, they kind of, well, I agree, I understand why you think that way and makes common sense, but I don't want it anyway. I, I just think we're headed the wrong way with that. Yeah, it's like, you know, there we, uh, if we never talk about the things that we really want, that, that we as citizens, that's what a democracy is, we, we get to decide the authority, right. you know, lays with the citizen, the buck stops there. 
And if citizens, you know, I, I don't know why it seems that not only the Republicans, but some of the, the folks on our side uh, say we can't have nice things. I mean, we can have whatever we want. You know, I mean, if, if we all decide that it makes a whole lot more sense that we have health care, that everybody's covered with health care, and we want to save all the money that we're going to save, and we're going to have better outcomes, we have every right to say that. Right. And I think, uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm not going to put it all on the candidates or on the politicians, because I think we as Democrats, uh, as activists in the field, it's it, it's part of our job, too. And yeah, I think we're all we're all falling short because we we're we get timid, we get scared, we're going to offend somebody. And so we don't. Right. Yeah. And, and then we listen to consultants who, you know, cycle after cycle, give us the same advice. And uh, you and you watch people, even at the national, you watch the news and you see people making rookie messaging. Your friends. And, and they're, oh, somebody, okay. Um, uh, and, and they make rookie mistakes. And, and these, the consultants who are getting paid an awful lot of money. I mean, for Lisa and I, it's pretty much a labor of love. You know, we, we, we cover our expenses, but, uh, uh, but you know, for, for these consultants, they make a lot of money. It's the same bad advice year after year. In some states, they've shut down uh, people like me and others in other parts of the country who do this kind of training. In, in Wisconsin, uh, they, they shut down somebody doing this training because the consultants didn't like it. Right. But my feeling is if the consultants are so smart, how is it that the party who's grounded pretty much in reality, uh, how, how is it that we never seem to do better than break even with these People with who crazy believe, people yeah, yes. who believe Hillary Clinton orders baby parts on her right, pizza. Right. I mean, seriously, I mean, how in the world do we not doing better them? And I think, you know, for, for what we did here, we we, uh, we we base a lot of what we do on George Lakoff's work uh, on framing and messaging. Right. I think you you know that, too. He's an advisor for us. Uh, we're connected with other people to know him. And um, and it's time to change it. And if it's not going to happen at the national level, then we have to do it. Because grassroots activists, you know, pretty much all the best ideas come out of the grassroots and, and out of our, our, our local and state legislators who, who, who can come out. I mean, you've been saying this common sense thing for how many decades now? And this is, you know, you, you aren't afraid to say it. I wonder if, if, if all the rest of our, our people would say, you know, we, we aren't going to be afraid to say it anymore. I wonder what would happen. We'd be surprised because we might start winning more elections. And then to me, I mean, unrelated issue of gun violence. I mean, I've been pushing some things that the Gun Owners Alliance is, is the most radical, extreme anti-gun stuff in Minnesota history. I thought that was overkill, but I guess it was because nobody's it was the most extreme because nobody's ever proposed that kind of thing before. And to me, they said, well, you can do that if you're in a safe district. Well, my new district is 80 plus percent new. I went my district went from Northern Roseville to near the state capital. Now I go from Northern Roseville to Blaine, totally different district, totally different constituency. But to me, it's in the swing districts where you most ought to stand for things. Because in a year like this, somewhere between a third and a half of the voters are not gonna even vote. We know 35% won't because we've never touched 65% turnout in a non-presidential year. We know 35% will not be voting. 50% will not vote if it's a terrible year. And you know, instead of trying to do this on the gun violence stuff, they're saying in these swing districts, we can't afford to offend that one quarter or one half or one tenth of 1% of the gun, gun, the NRA folks, we can't offend, afford to offend one quarter of a percent of them who might possibly vote for a Democrat if we don't talk too much about it. Instead, we're gonna say the 35% of the public who's not even bothering to vote, we're not gonna appeal to them even though the polls so they're 70 percent with us we're not going to appeal to them because we don't want to lose this one quarter of one percent so yeah, anyway, yeah and then sorry. and 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 what's interesting is that you know I, I go back to 2016 and 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 bernie sanders was running and and uh and what what i found interesting was that i saw interviews with people who lived in rural areas people in the south uh pe people who who we normally would think are not not our people are with us. Sure. And, and it, it was amazing because in effect, Bernie's message was the same as Trump. And there were people in there saying, we 
we think, you know, well, yeah, I kind of support Donald Trump, but you know that that Bernie Sanders has got some good ideas too, because right. they're basically saying everyone forgets about about us, and 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 we don't think the rich guys ought to take all the money, and on and on. I think there are more people with us than we think, and I think we ignore them at our peril. And and one more thing on that. Um... The political consultants think of everything in a left, right, center, left, center, right spectrum. I don't like to see the world that way. I call myself a conservative progressive, conservative values, honesty, hard work, fair play, what we used to call conservative values and progressive vision. But people in Minnesota, Paul Wellstone, when he first ran, a lot of people, well, he's too liberal for me, but he fights for the little guy. Same thing, the, the Republicans for Wellstone. Same thing with the Democrats for Reagan. Well, he might be too conservative for us, but I think he's got a better vision or something. Right. You know, people are voting from a whole different, do they trust people? Yeah. And we are, the political consultants are trying to put everything into a box is if everything has got to be closer to the center. So the more extreme <coughs> radical right stuff the Republicans go to now, it's sort of a neo-fascist movement. Yeah. The further they go that way, the further we got to go towards that because we got to be in the center of the road, which... Jim Hightower from Texas once said the only thing in the middle of the road are yellow stripes and dead armadillos. <laughs> and, um, and I think we got to recognize people are voting by what makes sense to them. They don't have to agree with you. I know lots of people say, well, I don't agree with you on this, but I trust your judgment. And that's what we have to be appealing to. And before we should start with Linda's question, then I see a lot of others in the chat. So we should talk about the specific questions. Yeah. Um... Did you want me to start? There's been, uh, been a, a number of questions in the chat for quite a while. Did you want to do that or how do you want to? Um... Sure, go ahead. We'll go quickly. You, I'll try and be yeah, sure. Let's do some you. of that. And, and, and then I want to come back and talk specifically about framing. Okay, uh, and okay. So, well, some yeah, of the let's... questions might get to that. Okay. <sighs> um, so, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, somebody asked if there's a link to the healthcare study in the uh, Mercatus um, website. And I'll just tell you, uh, there are a lot of articles on healthcare studies and things in on that uh, website. So uh, and, if and, you're Ann Jones in, is on here too. And she has links to a lot of that too, I'm sure. Uh, and well, feel yeah, free so to throw Anne those in the chat. Things in. So um, then uh, let's see. Uh, what can the legislature do this session with bonding using the surplus funds to preserve hospitals that are closing until funding can be found for them regionally? Um, good question. I don't think anything will happen out of the bonding bill because that's kind of all, there's so many other things already in there and hospitals have never been funded that way. And frankly, it wouldn't do a lot of good because most of the reason they're closing, well, it's partly because the way we pay for them. It's partly the fact that most of them are owned by hospital chains now who find it more convenient to have all their stuff in a different method. So it's it's unfortunate because we got to keep them open. We desperately need to, but that's why we need a healthcare system instead of this patchwork thing we have, which doesn't work. Right. Um, and okay, how would workers' compensation medical insurance fit into, uh, into your model? Good, good question. How Workers' comp and auto insurance are both two separate healthcare insurance things. We would cover all the medical expenses for, if you're a Minnesotan, we'd cover all your medical expenses. Um, I've had back surgery twice. You know, you go to, first thing you have a back problem, first thing they ask you is, were you injured in a car accident or did this injury happen at work? Because they want to push it off to somebody else to pay the bills. Not, not what's the problem, but where did it happen? Mm -hmm. And um, so we would be covering all the medical care under workers' comp and under auto insurance which means their premiums for auto insurance would drop by like 30, 40%. And I think for workers' comp, um, it'd be more than half, I think, in many cases, because most of the cost of workers' comp is for the injured worker care, not for the lost wages. Um, and so we'd be covering that. That way you don't have all the legal fights over who's responsible. You don't have people being pushed off saying, oh, it's somebody else's fault. You get the care you need, you're, you were hurt. You get the care you need. We don't have to fight over who's paying for it. The healthcare system is. And so that brings down, we're, employers should love that because it brings down their workers' comp premiums tremendously. And can, can, uh, Lisa, can we take a live question from Linda Hopkins? Or a, well, sure. Yeah, that's questions? up to you guys. I'm just saying there's like a ton yeah. of them in the, in the chat too. So yeah, you yeah, can, I just you can take a live question if you want. That's fine with me. Thank you. Linda Hopkins. Thank you, George. I appreciate it. 
Um, John, I've been a longtime supporter of yours, as you know, but I have I have three comments. One is uh, when I was working as a lawyer, I saw an internal document from a national HMO, which said, despite all our uh, efforts, the health outcomes for patients has not increased at all due to our efforts. I thought, oh, that's <laughs> really great. Um, second, I was at the town hall when President Clinton spoke about his national health care plan. And the first question out of the bat to him was, other than providing good health care, what are the financial benefits uh, under your plan? Uh, and President Clinton's response was, well, I happen to think good public health care is of financial benefit to this society. After all, we have to have soldiers and laborers and teachers that are healthy <laughs> to do their jobs and protect our country. But President Clinton had a way with words. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. I mean, that's what we should talk. That's why we want a good health care system because it's a huge benefit, even if it costs more, it'd be better, and, yeah. Yeah, and thirdly, I uh, have to just support George George's position that to be authentic is one of the most important things a candidate can offer. Wellstone was supported by people who weren't Democrats all the time because they trusted him. They thought he was a good guy. And if we have politicians up there that quibble about, well, maybe we we'll want just a little bit more health care, but not too much, I believe the citizenry is not going to really trust that energy or, or our commitment to really helping them. They know the Republicans are batshit crazy, but I got to say it, Trump had energy. You know, he'd take you to hell and back, but you'd go on a trip, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I had to say. Yeah, good point. I agree. It's people people want something they trust. And you know, if we if we say we're gonna be all things to all people, but we shouldn't be afraid of saying we want a system not just for Linda, we want a system for everyone that takes care of this. Once a couple of years ago, one of my colleagues was saying when they were saying, John, but we can't have that good. Is there, where in the world do we have a, this kind of benefits that it covers virtually everything? Uh, and, and I said, what are you saying? We've got too many benefits in this bill? Yeah, if nobody else says, I said, wait, wait, we're spending twice what anybody else in the world spends on healthcare. Maybe we ought to have better healthcare than others do for that kind of money. <laughs> and, um, but that's, that's the whole, thing. I mean, I, I worry other countries are going to go backwards. I mean, um, the UK government for the last 10 years has been working with United Health Group, and they're trying to structure some of United Health Group's concepts into the British healthcare system. And they're going to destroy their own system because they're trying to copy ours, which no person in their right mind would do. But anyway, Lisa, you got more questions. Yeah. Uh, documented one. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I want to say to people, Ann Jones did put a link to hcaminnesota.org in the chat, but I will also send that link out tomorrow in the recap that I send. So if you can't get to it through the chat, I'll make sure everybody gets the link to that. Um, let's see. Another question. How do you talk to those who don't want undocumented immigrants to be covered? That's, that's a good question for messaging, because when I first started working on this uh, 10 years ago after the Affordable Care Act passed, I kept using this as the toughest question at the time. And if you don't think it's a tough question or don't think it was a tough question, um, in August 2009, Barack Obama had a national address to the country in front of the joint session of Congress to speak. He asked for a chance to speak about his plans for a health care reform. And in that speech, you wouldn't remember it except for the story I'm going to tell, and you wouldn't remember the story, you just remember the response to it. In the story, Obama was saying, because he knows how unpopular it is we're going to cover those illegal people. He didn't use undocumented, he used, we're not going to cover, he said, we are, don't worry, we're not going to cover people who are in the country illegally. 
That's effectively the phrase he used. The response, some guy yelled out, you lie. Mm. Remember the response, everybody remembers the response. A member yeah. of Congress stood up in a, or yelled out in a national audience, you lie. The next day, the Obama administration backtracked further because remember his plan was gonna cover everyone. But don't worry, we're not gonna cover them. The next day, the White House clarified, not only are they not gonna let people buy through, um, get involved in the public programs, they're not gonna buy through the insurance exchange either. I'm thinking one, that's kind of immoral. Yeah. Um, we're going to throw people off a cliff because where they were born. And, and I'd say, we don't do that. We're better than that. If you have a 12 year old kid in an auto accident on the side of the road bleeding, we're not going to tell them bleed to death, kid. You were born in Mexico. Um, we don't do that. And number two, we already do cover them for the expensive stuff, the emergency room, the hospital care and so on. We just don't cover them for the things that could prevent them from having to end up there. And um, so we already do that. And then the third thing I'd say is, you know, what kind of public health system do you have when the people who are, if you look at Worthington, Minnesota, the meat packing plants, you work at, look at fast food joints, how many people working in those places handling our food are coming from our undocumented folks from Mexico and others? You know, what kind of public health system if the people touching your food have infectious diseases and you're not gonna treat them? And so it's a terrible public health. And if Obama said that, if he said instead, we are going to cover them. I know you're going to say it's political suicide, but let me tell you what happens if the people who serving, working at your meat packing plants and everything else have infectious diseases, we don't treat them. What does that mean for your health? I think if he talked that way and then didn't call them those people or illegal people, but talked about, we want a system that covers everyone because we're that kind of people. And it's actually cheaper to do that. To me, the way you take that on is to take it head on. And I've got a bill actually would expand um, undocumented coverage for those under Minnesota care um, because we don't cover them now in Minnesota. But to me, that's a much harder sell than selling that as part of something else because here, I can't afford to go to the dentist and here you're gonna give it to them, those people who are illegal. It's harder because people resent somebody else getting something they don't get. If we're giving it to everyone, I think it takes care of it a lot easier. But I think the worst thing you can do is what Obama did. He was saying we're going to cover everyone, but then he was on the defensive because he knew you could never sell it. And once you know you can never sell it, you say, well, don't worry, we're not going to cover them. And the response, you're lying to us. Yeah. It pins him down. He, he was in the worst possible place there, a time that should have been a victorious speech for him about what his vision for the country is. Instead, he was on the defensive. They chased him down and he ran further. Well, and maybe then that's a good segue into a little bit more than the framing. Uh, you know, it's it it's a moral issue, and and you say that I'll I'll quote from the book. This is fundamentally a moral issue. It is a matter of fairness. We cannot ignore the cruelty of avoidable pain and suffering caused by the failure to cover dental care. We cannot consider it acceptable that people do not have a doctor check out a potentially life saving condition because they cannot afford to pay the deductible. We cannot fail to recognize the lives we destroy by denying treatment to young adults struggling with mental health crises. And you know, what I see there is an absolutely perfect example of all of what we've been teaching here. It, it, uh, all messaging is about morality. It, all of what happens in the legislature, in Congress, in any kind of lawmaking is all about right and wrong. It's a conversation every activist can have. It's also a conversation every voter can have. So when we're talking to voters, talking about right and wrong, talking about the moral part of it, it, it releases the tension from everyone because you don't have to know every last detail of every plan. But you, if you can give a good solid moral basis for why we're doing what we're doing, that helps. The other thing that I see here is, is that you bring it to people. So uh, you talk about it's a moral issue, but we can't, uh, you know, uh, uh, we can't ignore the cruelty of uh, not having dental care and such. You, you bring it into people. And so I would encourage folks uh, to, uh, we'll have a link for you, but you, there's a, a link to, on the Minnesota Health Plan website for Senator Marty's book. Uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can buy one to help the cause. You can also download it for free. And um, and I just think it's it's a it's a wonderful place to go for that. And so I just I, you know I have to ask you I 
I think you're familiar with the work of George Lakoff, but my guess is that your skills in, in framing and messaging come somewhat naturally, or do you have magical secrets you can, you can, you can share with us? <laughs> what what I, I feel the best way to deal with messaging is figure out what makes sense to you. Everybody on this call is involved in this because we care about this. Um, every one of us are thoughtful, caring, thinking people. If something makes sense to us, figure out why it makes sense and figure out how we try and explain that to people. And I think the biggest thing that makes framing so screwed up is by people, again, I'll say political consultants telling us this is better messaging. I mean, I've been in so many things where our legislative caucus or others, they have trainings in which people are going to, we're going to focus on messaging. Okay, what keywords we should talk about? Freedom's a good word. Um, they, they talk about what words, um, choice is a good word. They figure out all these big words and then we're going to try and fit that word in everywhere we can. No, just figure out what makes sense and talk about it that way. And when you hear how they come back, um, you, you can predict what they're going to say. I mean, right after when we introduced the bill, because you have to reintroduce every two years. Um, and when we introduced it right after Trump's election in 2017, um, some of the new legislators who had signed on as co-authors said, let's do, a, let's do a news conference, which I don't mind doing. And so we did one. And I said, I bet you I can pick the first question. Like I said, we just elected Donald Trump as a nation because people want less government. Now you're offering us government-run healthcare. Isn't this out of tune with the times or something? And I said, uh, I knew it was coming. It was the first question they asked. And my response was simply, well, have you read the bill? Do you know what's in the bill? Because this bill isn't government-run health care. The Minnesota Health Plan would be paying for everything, but it's run by you, the patient, and your medical providers, the ones you choose. You're making the decisions, not insurance companies again. And that, to me, is just figure out what they're going to say and then explain why that's wrong. When somebody call, accuses you of being... I'll tell you one story that uses another politician. It's not fair to him because he's no longer in office and, and so on. But Al Franken, he signed on to Bernie Sanders' um, Minnesota uh, Medicare for All bill um, in the year he left office, a few months before then. Bernie Sanders had been pushing the bill, and that year he started getting co-authors. They got about 12, 13 authors that year, and Franken signed on. And you'd picture this would be his chance to really pound home why this is so important. His response the news conference was something to the effect of, you know, my good friend Paul Wellstone once introduced a bill like this. So I guess it's something we ought to take a look at. I thought, boy, is that a rave review of a bill you just signed on to? <laughs> and, and, and I know why he do it. If I had this imaginary conversation with him, which again, is a, it's an imaginary conversation. I never had the discussion because he left office after that. But I was going to ask him, Al, why were you so timid? And his response would be, John, you know what they would have called me if I if I was enthused about this? What? They'd call me a socialist. And my response is, and Al, what did they call you when you supported the Affordable Care Act? A socialist. I don't care what you do. If you're a Democrat, they're going to call you a socialist. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and so what I picture would happen with somebody like that, and the way you educate politicians who are listening to the consultants too much, is he would have started putting that in the speech and he'd be speaking to groups of often largely supporters, but not exclusively that. He has all kinds of groups the U.S. senator speaks to. And um, people would be, he'd say somewhere late in the speech, you know, yeah. And I, I'm, I've co-authored Sanders' Medicare for All bill, which my good friend Paul Wellstone did. So I think we ought to take a look at it. You get pretty good applause for that one. And politicians love applause lines. And so later on, a few weeks later, you know, he'd put it earlier in the speech and say something, this is something we really got to take a look at this Medicare for all. And people give louder applause. And then he'd start, soon he'd be starting the meeting saying, you know, we need to do this. It's about time we do this. Because that's the way it works. You talk about something that might make sense to people and they, even if they don't, even if they're, well, I'm not sure it might be too expensive or it might be something else. I think they're more willing to accept it. Well, and there are there are frames that can help us out. And one that I heard, which I really like, which ended up in in the title of this, I heard first from uh, the North Words group up in Pine City, Rush City, uh, and Virginia Stark led, leads or led that group. 
and is still very active. And they came up with healthcare made easy. And what I like about it is, you know, we, we, when we talk about uh, uh, connecting with voters, you, you want to start a conversation. Now, you, you know, you can, you can list a bunch of facts and reasoning and, and people are going to go, well, this person knows more than me. I'm going to shut up because I'm going to look stupid. Instead, if you talk about healthcare made easy, you've opened up a question in their mind. Why do you say that? And well, everything about healthcare is hard right now. And you can list a thousand reasons why it's hard. And you go, but in, with the Minnesota Health Plan, it's healthcare made easy. You don't have to worry about insurance. You don't have to worry about losing your job. You don't have to worry that you can't afford premiums. You don't have to worry about all of this stuff. It's easy. You take your card, you go to the to the doctor and say, I'm sick, doctor goes, we'll take care of you. Right. And, and so those kind of things. And, and so, uh, something else which you use in your book, which are, is really important that uh, in, 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 that's very central to framing and that's metaphors. And you use two in particular in the book that I, I really like, uh, given the time we have, pick one of the following two <laughs> and, and, and tell us how, how you think about it. Uh, one is, Healthcare should be covered like police and fire protection. And the other one is if we operated schools like healthcare. Sure. Okay. The police and fire one's easy because it's just, it's a public service. And, and if you have a fire in your house, you don't want to chase somebody. You don't want to have find out, well, you don't have the right insurance plan. So they're not going to put out your fire, but I'll use the other one. I'll talk for a minute about the other one. I like that because it helps explain why you save money, why it's a better logical way to deliver healthcare. If we compare the way we fund schools, the way we fund hospitals. We funded schools the way we do hospitals, which is not a good idea to do, and it's not something I'm advocating for, but at the end of every day, a teacher would have to spend half an hour, 20 minutes or so, calculating how much time he or she spent with each student, how many supplies they used, then they'd have to send those numbers down for each student down to the school's billing office, our schools in Roseville don't have billing offices. Um, and then they'd have to fold in all the, uh, the extra expenses, the administrative costs, the janitorial expenses, the utilities, everything. And then they send those out in monthly bills to parents. And because it's so expensive, you'd need school insurance to cover the cost. And so you'd have Blue Plus for education and health partners could have education partners and you care could have you learn and so on. <laughs> and uh, Medica could have Educa and all those things. And remember, each of these needs a huge bureaucracy with million dollar salaries and all the people who are going to do it. Education is as big as healthcare, So we'd have to have equally large branches for this. And then employers, because buying that in school insurance is expensive and parents can't afford it. So employers would have to offer it as a benefit to their employees for their kids. And so you have all that bureaucracy and everything else. And then, of course, you have to, parents are going to constantly be getting copays and deductible things, and they're going to be fighting with their insurance company about whether something was out of network or not, whether this teacher was or whatever else. Why would we want that? Think of the money. It doesn't save money. Um, think how much more you'd spend on all the time. Everybody has all the paper shuffling, all the everything else. And the school billing office also has to have a collection office, too. Um, think of all the expense employers would have insurers would have, parents would have, schools would have. And then does it improve education? Of course not. It takes parent time away from doing, helping their kids with their homework instead, figuring out how to pay the co-pays. Um, it takes everybody, teacher's time and administrator time at school into billing instead of teaching. It's a terrible way to do it. And to me, that's a kind of analogy that people can grasp. And of course we wouldn't want to do that. That would be stupid. And that's the point, so. Uh, the uh, that whole you know I I was really impressed with those because metaphors are just so so important and they just make things much more easy to understand because you're mapping something new onto something that people already understand and um, uh, that and uh, uh, let me do this it's it's eight o'clock I do have one more important question then after that we'll stick around for questions uh, is it all right Senator Marty to go till eight thirty sure. Okay, let me ask this last question. And I put it last because just like in movie credits, if you're an actor, you want to either be the first one in the credits or you want to be the last one. And uh, so this is not, uh, being last year is not an indication of this is this question's importance. In fact, I think this is an, a, a, the, the central 
uh, issue for Democrats moving forward in the future. And it has to do with rural Minnesota or rural areas of the United States. Um, what's happening to healthcare in rural areas of America is nothing short of a disaster. And my question is not what Metro people or Democrats in general, general should say to rural voters, although I think that's important that we know, but what messages can democratic activists in rural areas deliver to their friends and neighbor, neighbors to offer new perspectives and plant some seeds in their, in their heads about, about uh, different ways to think about these things? Sure. And, and, and part of that gets back to the whole concept of what, what we're trying to do. In 2016, in the presidential primary time, Bernie Sanders cleaned up on the Iron Range and he was doing very well in greater Minnesota. And four months later, those folks all voted overwhelmingly for Trump um, and locked them into leaving things I care about. Was it because Bernie was close to Trump in politics? No, it was because People were scared of health care because rural folks couldn't afford it. Too expensive. And those who are buying in the individual market, which is only 3% of the public, but it's disproportionate, heavily disproportionate to rural communities. Huge numbers of people in small towns are buying in things. And the premiums that year were going up 50%. And the Democratic message that year, if you go back and look at it, that fall was Affordable Care Act is good and we're going to make it better. If you're seeing your premiums go up by 50% and you're scared silly, you may have been voting for Bernie Sanders because he sounded like he made sense to you, but you're going to vote for Trump because he, he said, we're going to throw out the whole thing and start over. Well, it was a pack of lies, what he was going to do, but, um, but they buy it. To me, in rural communities, they're paying more for health care, getting less for it. Um, first district down Rochester surrounded area of the state um, healthcare costs are higher than anyone because Mayo Clinic is setting the prices a lot more. So you look, anybody's insurance premiums in those communities are much higher. They have to drive much further to get to hospitals, everything else. By having more clinics in there, now, as of now, if you live in Grand Portage, the far northeast corner of the state over Lake Superior, you have to, and you're having a child birth, um, you have to drive two hours and 45 minutes to get to a hospital in Duluth to deliver the baby two hours and 45 minutes. It's not that there's nobody that lives up there. It's just we prioritize putting it into the health systems that run those clinics to say, let's shut down those local hospitals. We can have a small clinic here, but for a hospital, you'll go here. To me, we have something to offer. We have something that the same way that we lost all those folks to Trump in a two year period of time, um, we could gain them back. Not simply, it's not gonna be as easy to gain back because now they're convinced we're evil and everything else. But you talk about this and, and show them how we want to do this and how it makes sense and ask them if you have questions, what's your question? Why? And their questions will tend to be, well, how are we going to pay for that? I can't afford what I got now. And point out, well, through our stupid system, we're paying twice what everybody else pays. That's why you can't afford it. So I, I do think that health care is something that could be a huge winning issue in greater Minnesota, far more than any social issue and and wages and working conditions, they're getting the short end of the deal there too, but healthcare is the most obvious one. Yeah. Um, Lisa, we know, I know we have some more questions. I, I, I do wanna point out that with the, there's a very active chat going on, which I think is great. We will send the chat out along with links uh, to various things that have been talked about tonight. I know Anne has put a number of links in there and, um, and, and we have others, and so we'll do that. But uh, let's open it up for questions. And Lisa, if you wanna ask questions, and maybe then uh, there are folks with hands raised too. So I'll let you moderate that. Um, some of the questions that were, are in the chat have been answered by some of the other chat people. So especially Anne, and um, I'm, I'm sorry if I say this name wrong, Adina. Um, so please look at those and they're, they're, they've sent out um, uh, links to other websites and things like that. And Anne has even very kindly added her phone number into the chat. So you can, I'm assuming, so you can call her if you have more questions. And I do know that Anne, I just saw her for the first time last week at the panel discussion, but I know she is a wealth of information on this subject as well. So uh, 
so she since she put that in there, I guess feel free to call her. So let's just go to uh, some of the questions of the hands raised. Um, and we'll start, we'll just go across. Carrie, I believe was the first one who had her hand raised. So go ahead, Carrie. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I have a question um, for you all on framing. So how do you respond when you're having conversations about transitioning our healthcare in this way to the layers of people that would be lost, um, that would lose their employment if we got bureaucratic layers. Um, how do we positively frame that um, to our advantage? Sure. Um, good question, because it's an important one, because it is one of the problems with doing it. It's, it's really simple to set up a logical healthcare system. The problem is getting out of the old one and getting into the new one is much more difficult. There was a study by the Lewin Group about 10 years ago of a generic universal healthcare system in Minnesota. And they concluded there were about 40, 38 or 40 or 42,000, something like that, Minnesotans would lose jobs in the health bureaucracy fields. Um, and we have to take care of them. 42,000, when you hear of a plant closing and you lose 200 jobs, 42,000 is huge. Good news is it's a one-time hit. Number two thing is, and these numbers are pre-COVID, so I don't know what it's happening now. We had much bigger swings during COVID. But during pre-COVID years, the typical monthly job transition in Minnesota was about 150,000 people a month. In other words, when, when employment is growing, it might be 150,000 people leaving jobs and 152,000 taking jobs. Um, in other words, it's, and if in a time of recession, it might be 150,000 people leaving jobs and only 148,000 being hired. But bottom line is for perspective that 40,000 people is less than a third, close to a fourth of what happens in one month in terms of job transitions. So job transitions are happening all the time. That's item one. Item two, a lot of the people who would be losing their jobs don't need retraining. They are doctors who are working in insurance or nurses, or especially not RNs, but LPNs, but every kind of nurse. So many people are trained in medical professions. You don't have to retrain them. You just, and there's enough need for those jobs right away in the medical field. We are short of most medical professionals. I used to use the line and it's dated now because he's long gone, but Bill McGuire, who was the CEO of United Health Group, um, he's a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have needed to retrain him. I'd say, you know, unfortunately we couldn't match his $105 million a year salary, but, but he didn't need retraining. And so we would retrain them. Number Three, we provide funding in the plan. We don't have the specific numbers. That's what the cost analysis type of thing we have to do. We provide retraining benefits to people, um, dislocated worker benefits for losing their job, for getting retrained, everything else you have to, that's a moral obligation we'd have. We would take that seriously. Number four, people who lose their jobs now are a lot worse off than these folks would be for the biggest reason is if somebody gets laid off, they lose their health care. And I know a person, actually a DFL activist who lost her sister, a 50, 48, 50 year old um, nurse, registered nurse in the Twin Cities area, working at a nursing home, got laid off because of the recession in 2008. And six months later, she was dead of a perfectly treatable condition. She was trying to guess what it was and she guessed wrong. And a sibling was picking her up for, she lived alone, picking her up for a family gathering. So how sick she was. They took her to the emergency room, quarter million dollars of expense, and she was dead a few days later. Totally treatable condition. Um, we wouldn't have people losing their health care at a time they're losing their job. They don't have to worry about the additional stress of that. So all those things would, my cases would do that. And I used to say how, you know, we don't, in terms of jobs, this bill would be the best thing for creating jobs because people wouldn't stay in the wrong job so long because they need the healthcare benefits. Mm -hmm. And the so-called the stereotypical entrepreneur who works 80 hours a week in their basement or garage trying to get their new invention to market. They don't work 80 hours a week in their basement or garage. They have to work 40 hours a week somewhere else. So they have healthcare and then they work nights and weekends in their garage. And all those transitions in the economy where people are staying in the wrong jobs because they need the benefits, um, we'd be losing all of that and employment would go up um, mm -hmm. and there are more people to fill jobs because healthier people. So it would, it's a, it's a very serious hit. 
It's a very serious criticism. It's a legitimate one because um, we would be disculcating workers. Uh, to me, we'd be better off if we just paid those workers to sit at their desks and do nothing <laughs> because it would save all the paperwork and all the everything else. But that's not a logical thing to do and we're not proposing that. We are saying these folks would need jobs, would need to be replaced. And again, for the perspective, it's about a quarter of the number of people who transition in any given month. Okay, Anne. Uh, Lisa, I, I just wondered if you saw the question up in the chat earlier about um, administrative costs, because I um, did I miss that one getting answered? Because that was mm -hmm. a good news story too. Um, single payer financing is a job creator and then there is so much money sloshing around wasted in um, in administrative costs. I wondered if- And I haven't seen, and Anne, you may know better than me if there are newer numbers, but I've been still been using the 31, 33% of our healthcare dollars uh -huh. going to administrative costs. Uh -huh. I actually think it's much higher than that because again, that counts the uh -huh. that counts the insurer and the provider yes. administrative costs. It does not count the employer who is, trying to buy a health insurance plan, which is a significant chunk of time and train their employees how to do it. It does not count the individual's time filling out all the forms. But I, I think you can say it's it's clearly over a third uh, of our healthcare dollars yeah. are spent there. And uh, the, the, the Himmelstein and Woolhandler study re repeated, they did 2003 and then they repeated it in 2019. They came up with, it, up, go, it went up from 31% to 34%. I think okay. they tried to account for the provider side and the payer side. They did not account for the individual right. um, time and time and effort. So you, th so there's, you're right. There's still so more, 30, 34 percent number we should be using now. And, 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 and then clearly, you tell people that that's $1.4 trillion a year. And they estimate we could save at least half of that, which yeah. is 600 billion. Now people don't always know what, how, how big those numbers are, but really the good news is that there's plenty of money to go around. Right. At 34% of Minnesota, what we're now, we're probably about 60 billion a year. So a third of that's 20 billion a year. And um, if we save half of that, 10 billion a year, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a lot of savings. And, um, and that plus the price negotiations, the other place we save the money. Exactly. Because um, again, the Minnesota Department of Health did a study of several procedures on knee replacement was eight to one price disparity nationally about the same time it was 16 to one. Cheapest knee replacement, not cheapest, but the lowest cost hospital for knee replacement was $34,000. The highest cost one was 55,000. 16 to one price disparity. And nowhere else do you see, you see 16% price disparity might be something you'd find when you're buying groceries or other things, but 1600% disparity you don't find and negotiating fair prices. Um, again, that cuts out middlemen in the process, but um, that's how you save a lot of money. Um, and before we get to, to, to Riley, I'd like to, uh, to just, uh, just another idea that, that I think uh, it'd be interested to hear that's related to that is that what you get on a job for your health insurance is earned by you. I mean, you wouldn't be working there unless you got that health insurance. You know, if your health insurer today said no more health insurance, we're not going to provide it, you'd go work someplace else. So it's 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 wages, it's or it is earnings. And uh, should a plan like this get passed, uh, I think we all have to remember that this is something that we need to demand from our employers. Some employers, if you have if 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 a spouse provides the insurance, some employers will give you the money they would have would have otherwise paid into health insurance. So and keeping that in mind that all of it, that and in a way, this kind of a plan could very well result in a raise, or at least a raise in, in income that comes directly to you. Yeah, labor, labor unions, um, especially in the building trades, you look at how many dollars per hour. I mean, because uh, as carpenter, you, you look at here's what their journeyman wages are per hour. Here's how much goes into their retirement. Here's how much goes into healthcare. It's, I don't know, six, seven dollars an hour or more. Um, huge amounts, and they have to negotiate for that every year. You take that away from it, they can negotiate for better wages too. Yeah. Um, I see one other one before we get to Riley and that I, we didn't get to earlier. Speak to long-term care insurance. Monthly premiums are now 13, 20 a month for two. Continue rise. What can legislators do to control these rising rates? About the only thing we can do is recognize 
that long-term care insurance is a dysfunctional market. People need it. And the legislatures have been trying to make it more affordable to people by trying to provide subsidies for people buying it. But the bottom line is a lot of insurers who are trying to carry it and it doesn't work well and they've gone out of business and a lot of people who have kept it for, they get it in their 50s and they get 70 years old and they're going to need it soon and their premiums double in a year. That's actually happened to people. I've known one couple, it literally doubled in a year and you take it away, you lose it, you lose it all. So they keep buying, paying into it and they can't afford it. Um, the w best way I'd explain how it makes sense is we're already covering three quarters of nursing home costs in Minnesota, three quarters of it the public is paying for. The only the one quarter who's in this boat, they're either figuring, okay, I'm going to lose all my assets, everything in my estate and everything else is going to be gone if I don't buy insurance for this. So it's a gamble with that. And then the state tries to take back money for people to cover the medical assistance costs and people try and hide money, try and give it to the kids. All those games, all the long-term care insurance um, would be gone if we would simply switch and have a healthcare system that covered it. And again, we're already paying three quarters of the cost in Minnesota. The other quarter could be done as well. But um, unfortunately, Betsy, there's nothing, nothing we can do other than other than I've, I've known my in-laws had a plan like that and they just kept getting hit with it. And in the end, one of them actually did need it. So you need it, but there's no simple answer other than figuring it's not a logical thing for people to do. They could judge when they could retire much better if they didn't have to worry about this huge variable of, of long-term care insurance. Well, Riley has been very patient. <laughs> so let's, Let's go to Riley and, and hear, what, hear what you've got to say. Thank you very much, George. Riley Schumacher, he, him, up in St. Cloud for most people on this call. Uh, my question is around what can we do to use surplus funds to possibly bond to purchase uh, closing hospitals in the rural areas of Minnesota? Because I'm concerned the maintenance costs and just quite literally maintaining the building is really going to cost less than repairing it in a year or two. So um, what can we sure. And I, I tried to answer that one a little bit earlier. You may not have been on at the time, but um, yeah, the bottom line is it's not likely that the bonding bill would be used that way. Um, it would be a good logical way to do things, but one, hospitals have never been funded that way. And two, with the system the way it is, um, I don't know who runs the, what hospital system runs the, whether it's Sanford or Essentia or whoever runs the St. Cloud hospitals, but um, center care, uh, center care. Okay. Um, but it's the kind of thing that St. Cloud might be one that might be helped more. It's the small town ones that smaller town ones that are getting pinched. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think what we're going to be doing in legislature and U.S. Congress and everywhere is going to be trying to provide some help to these these small rural hospitals and, and St. Cloud is not small rural, but um, the smaller hospitals and rural hospitals. And because there's no logical system in place, any one thing that could hit, I mean, and, and the federal government can step in. They have a lot more resources that way as with COVID showed. I mean, we would have thought every hospital would have been sunk. Their quote profitable services like surgeries were set aside and they were just hit with COVID and all the other expenses for PPE and everything else. Um, so yes, they desperately do, but it needs to be a funding system that works. I don't think um, subsidizing repairs on the buildings would do it. And frankly, the hospital system seem to take better care of the buildings than they do the people working in the buildings. Um, I remember during the 2008 recession, um, Minnesota nurses were on strike and I talked to one of the nurses in one of the picket lines she said, did you ever notice how the only places in the Twin Cities where you can see building cranes, construction cranes around all the hospitals, even during the recession, they're building fancier and fancier. It's a lot of people, the fanciest building they ever go to is the hospital. And, um, and that suggests, again, the corporate healthcare mentality where um, best paid people aren't the most sophisticated doctors or the best business people who run the, administer the hospital system. So I, I wish there was a solution to it because as you say, it's a lot cheaper to take care of them now than let them rot and then fix them in a few years. 
but that's not a very satisfactory answer. But bottom line is none of the things we've got in the current system are very satisfactory. Right. And especially in rural areas where, where healthcare is disappearing, literally disappearing, the clinics are going, hospitals are going. Uh, I, I really think this is, well, I'm not the only one. Um, for example, this book, Harvest the Vote, part of it's disappearing by, by Jane Klebb, uh, who's the chair of the Nebraska Democratic Party. She talks about healthcare in here and about other things. I, I firmly believe and with healthcare leading the way that Democrats have, have more to offer people in rural areas than Republicans do. We're, the people in, in rural Minnesota, and we've been around to, to all corners of the state over the last uh, six or seven years and talking with people on the ground and, and, uh, and you ask what people like and, and, or what they want, they want all the same things we do. And the Republicans don't deliver any of it for them at all. And so I, I agree with Senator Marty. I, I think that's the best suggestion we, we have. Lead with health care in rural areas. And also us folks who are in the metro area need to partner with folks in, uh, with our, our, our compadres in, uh, in Senate districts or organizing units, county units outside the metro to, to do whatever we can to help out too. If Democrats don't win back rural areas like we should have been winning all along, we are going to be in this stalemate for the rest of our lives. Yeah, it's, we're, we're fighting an uphill losing battle. And we got to realize the strategy we're trying of trying to not offend anybody isn't working very well. And because I see a question from Bob Beer, Robert Bierman, the, our colleague, legislative colleague, about with the political realities, other than creating a, a task or a study funding of the thing, what other steps could we take? One other bill that I've been pushing, because I think it would be a logical step forward in Representative Liz Bolden's carrying it in the House. She's a nurse from Rochester. And that is one that would do a couple of things. One, it would deprivatize our, our public health care systems where Medicaid and Minnesota care, um, they used to be where they were run in effect, run by the state. And if you're a Medicaid patient, you would go to the doctor and doctor would bill DHS and they pay the bill. Now we've got a managed care where the insurance plans, so the state contracts with um, insurance providers who do this. And, and then of course they say, oh, we've got dental coverage. How many dentists do you have? Oh, there are two of them in your, your part of the state that you could go to and, and they're not taking any more patients who are on Medicaid. So um, you're out of luck. Um, in effect, what this bill would do would be to throw out the health plans. Connecticut did this several years ago. They just said they were tired of the lack of accountability and the higher cost. This was a pilot project in the 1990s that was never analyzed. It was gonna save us money and there's no evidence it saved us money. We would replace that and simply cover it. And there are a couple other benefits to it. One of which is the money we saved from it, we'd be using some of it to provide grants to the federally qualified healthcare clinics so they could hire nurses, social workers, whoever to go out to address people with addiction or mental health challenges on the street, get them the care they need, which would actually help save money to the criminal justice and law enforcement systems who are trying to pick up people who are um, intoxicated by various substances or struggling with mental illness, um, would help with people like that. And the other thing it could do is because that population is over, well, it's about a fifth of the state, it's about 1.1 million people and about a fifth of the state. And we could just say, we're gonna figure out, we're gonna negotiate prices as we're paying these providers. Instead of using the Medicaid and the private payer system ones, you might decide maybe we ought to pay more for mental health. We can't get enough mental health providers because it's uh, not a profitable occupation. We can't get enough mental health hospitals Health East is shutting down, or Fairview, M Health Fairview is shutting down St. Joe's Hospital in St. Paul, mental health and substance use hospital. Why? Well, they're losing money on it. I asked the, when I wrote the board a couple of times, asking why they were doing this, because they had promised they would increase care in the East Metro when they bought up Health East. And they, well, we're losing money on it. Well, why didn't you try and fight for more money from it and tell, tell DHS, say, why don't you pay us more for mental health? and pay us less for the surgeries we're making so much money on. Why don't you do that in DHS? Why don't you do this? If we've got a shortage of mental health providers, why don't we pay more for that? 
and pay less for the things where everybody wants to be a surgeon because they make the most money there. Um, to me, that bill would make sense because it would start, it would create the infrastructure at DHS on a much bigger scale. They already have the infrastructure. It would scale it up to a fifth of the state population. It would help us do fair pricing, help us do price negotiation, and it would help us get people getting covered so the one fifth of the population, the lower income fifth of the population would for once be able to choose their own doctors and providers and they'd be able to get the care they need. So I think that may, that's a first step we I would take because it's both infrastructure and it's directly improving the lives of people. Yeah, I think uh, uh, one, one thing that, that, uh, that I don't think we talk about enough is that our current system spends a bit uh, too much on things that we don't actually need. I remember I did medical video production for a while and uh, was with uh, somebody at Mayo and we were talking about the uh, CAT scanners, which were uh, all, the, all the rage then. And uh, the person says to me, uh, do you know how uh, uh, that there are more CAT scanners here in the Mayo Clinic than there are in Canada? And I'm thinking, what does that say about our system where when hospitals are competing with MRI machines and CAT scanners and PET scanners and all these others, not like they keep them busy 24 hours a day, but they just want it because it brings more people to their specialist. And so. Uh, and that's, that's the way when, when United Health Group and their Optum group is now getting, buying up more and more providers. They're not just the insurer, they're the hospital systems now too. And, and I still, the example I always use, because it used to be in my district in Maplewood, St. John's Hospital, they had a radiation oncology, which is the fanciest type of imaging stuff yeah. uh, and, and, um, and um, cancer treatments and um, fancy stuff. And the hospital put one in. And then two years later, so the, some of the physicians working there put in their own clinic across the street. You know, there are a handful of these things around the state. They got one of them across at 1535 and 1540 or something, um, Beam Avenue in Maplewood. Why? Because we're competing with you guys for the best, the highest paying customers. They're owned by hedge funds now who hire the doctors to work at them and everything else. Talk about wasting healthcare dollars on hedge funds. Um, you're right. Well, we should wrap up. We're at 829. Uh, just want to point out that uh, we, we will have links for you. We'll send out uh, and it, to the minute, uh, to mnhealthplan.org. Also, we have two upcoming webinars, one on, uh, well, we call it letters to the editor, but it's basically one to many kind of communication. And then we have Hobie Stocking coming to do what we did here with healthcare. We'll be doing on the environment, doing a little bit deeper dive into framing uh, uh, environmental issues and the climate crisis. So uh, I, I want to thank John Marty, uh, you know, our, our senator, just a fabulous guy. Everybody who knows him loves him. Just, you know, uh, so happy you were able to be here to provide that clarity and the common sense around this issue that we all need. And uh, so thanks again. And thanks everybody for coming. Really appreciate it. John, did you have a last word? Yeah, well, thank you all. And, and again, George, what you're talking about tonight, messaging is so important. We've got the best ideas. Republicans are winning the elections. Maybe we should be talking about things in a way that makes sense to us. And that's what messaging is all about. So uh, thank, thank you all. And um, yeah, yeah, you can download the book online for free. And, and I don't make any money on the book. So it's not helping the cause to buy them. But oh, okay. I think Ann Jones may have some she can gives to people who donate to HCAM, but um, um, <laughs> oh. but anyhow, yeah. Thank you all. All right, everybody, thank, thank you, you so much. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Connectionslab.org.